Hello, my name is Eric Schaefer, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Valuable Insights, a company that specializes in using social media data and other online data in commercial litigation. This video is the second in a three-part series that explores how litigants can use social media data to support their case. In our first video, I explained what social media data is, how it fits into the litigation process, and then went through a case study involving deceptive advertising. In this video, I'll be covering intellectual property matters. The third video covering defamation will be coming out later this year. IP litigation is a huge topic, and there are lots of opportunities to use social media data. One type of case we've seen a lot of is trademark infringement, where the question of whether or not consumers are likely to be confused is central to the expert's analysis. Rather than trying to cover everything, I'll be focusing on the ways social media can fit into a likelihood of confusion analysis. Likelihood of confusion analyses typically rely on multi-factor tests. While circuits have different tests, there's a great deal of similarity in the underlying factors. For this presentation, I'll be using the Sleetcraft factors, which are relied on by the Ninth Circuit. Named after the 1979 case involving Sleetcraft boats, the factors are designed to determine whether the use of a trademark by a defendant is likely to lead to consumer confusion. Here we have the eight Sleetcraft factors. To prevail in a confusion analysis, a plaintiff doesn't have to show that consumers have already been confused or show that every factor weighs in its favor. Instead, the trier of facts will consider the factors as a whole when ruling on the case. As the factors are designed to measure consumer beliefs about products or services in the marketplace, litigants frequently retain marketing experts to evaluate data relevant to the factors. And while marketing experts cannot reach legal conclusions, it's common to see expert reports organized around the factors set out by the court. To reach your expert opinions, marketing experts typically rely on multiple sources of information, including academic research, their own experience as marketers, internal business documents, deposition testimony, and surveys conducted as part of the litigation. As I'll explain today, social media data can also play an important role. To see how, let's turn back to the sleek craft factors. While I'm sure attorneys and experts are now used to searching for instances of actual confusion on social media, there are at least four other factors that can be supported with social media data. Strength of the mark, proximity of the goods, marketing channels used, and defendant's intent. In the rest of this video, I'll be going through each of these factors. Let's start with the most obvious factor that can be supported with social media data, actual confusion. Actual confusion refers to evidence that directly shows consumers have been confused by a defendant's products or services. In general, finding evidence of actual confusion can be very difficult because consumers who are genuinely confused don't know they're confused and therefore may not articulate their confusion. Nonetheless, since it's currently possible to collect relatively large amounts of data from certain social networks, analysts can find those needle in the haystack posts if they have effective strategies of filtering through large data sets. Here we have a mock-up of a post we found showing actual confusion. This is from a case where a plaintiff sued a defendant after the defendant started selling a product bearing the plaintiff's trademark. We came across many instances of source confusion among consumers of the ad issue product on social media. Many people were sharing pictures of the defendant's products while tagging the plaintiff's brand. It's also possible to search for posts authored by users who discuss how they can pass off a defendant's products for a plaintiff's in the post-purchase environment. While the authors of these posts are not themselves confused, the belief that they can confuse others, and indeed their attempts to do so, can contribute to a likelihood of confusion. Here we have a review published from a user who claimed they purchased the defendant's products because they looked like the more expensive products sold by the plaintiff. While it's clear the author of this review is not confused, the author does go on to describe a situation where a reseller confused the defendant's products for the plaintiffs. Posts like these from confused consumers have been accepted as evidence of actual confusion by the courts. In 2013, Aura Labs filed a preemptive lawsuit against Kind Group, seeking a declaration that, among other things, its products didn't infringe Kind Group's trade dress. In its summary judgment ruling, the court accepted evidence of actual confusion in the form of collections of tweets. Aura Labs moved to strike the Twitter posts as inadmissible hearsay, but the judge struck down the motion, ruling that the Twitter posts provided are even more direct than accounts of third-party statements, these statements are not hearsay and are properly considered as evidence of actual confusion. In some cases, posts that display confusion are so rampant that it's possible to quantify them. 
One case like this involved a plaintiff and defendant who used similar brand names until the defendant rebranded and started using the same brand name as the plaintiff. We collected posts that mentioned the ad issue brand and which mentioned products sold by the defendant. We then split these posts into two groups, those published before the defendant's rebrand and those published after, and then we compared the rates of potential confusion between the two groups. In this case, the expert referred to these posts as being evidence of potential confusion rather than actual confusion because the marks were identical and there was no way to know for sure the author's intention. After manually reviewing a sample of the posts we collected, our analysts found that there were nearly four times as many posts that displayed potential confusion published after the rebrand than before, a statistically significant result. Let's now look at the next factor, strength of the mark. Strength of the mark is a measure of whether consumers associate a mark with a brand. Strength can refer to both commercial strength, how widely the mark is recognized in the marketplace, and conceptual strength, the obviousness of the connection between the product and service and the ad issue mark. Here we have an analysis focused on the commercial strength of the mark. The data show that the plaintiff received more Twitter mentions than any of the competing brands selected for the study, a finding that suggests the plaintiff's mark was strong. While the last graph counted the total number of mentions written by many users, this graph is a measure of engagement, or the number of times users interacted with posts authored by the plaintiff and the control brands. The data show that posts authored by the plaintiff generated more engagement as measured by retweets and likes than posts authored by the control brands. Taken together, these analyses provide a measure of brand strength for the plaintiff's brand. Interestingly, the courts have come to expect this kind of evidence in an analysis of the strength of the mark. In Keebler vs. Hall, the musician DJ Logic alleged that fellow musician who operated under the name Logic infringed his trademark name. In its analysis of the commercial strength of the DJ Logic mark, the court noted that strength could be determined using marketing evidence, which includes social media data. The court even noted that promotion on platforms such as Twitter and Facebook not only constitutes marketing, but is among the most popular and effective advertising strategies today and speaks to the commercial strength of the mark. Further, the court criticized Keebler for failing to offer a convincing analysis of social media data sufficient for a jury to conclude that the DJ Logic mark had received broad recognition. In particular, the judge noted that the plaintiff failed to provide an analysis of the number and kind of followers he had, and whether celebrities had retweeted Keebler's posts, which may have brought broader awareness to the DJ Logic mark. Next, we have a third factor called proximity of goods and services which is a measure of whether the plaintiff and defendant's products compete. One way to think about this factor from a marketing perspective is in terms of consideration sets. A consideration set comprises the small number of brands that a consumer considers when making a purchasing decision. One way to analyze consideration sets using social media data is to see which brands are mentioned in product reviews. For instance, here we have an analysis of consumer reviews for an ad issue product sold by a defendant. As shown in the graph, we found that the plaintiff was mentioned in approximately 10% of reviews for the defendant's product, more than double any other competitor. This analysis indicates that purchasers of the defendant's product included the plaintiffs in the same consideration set, demonstrating that the two parties were in direct competition with one another. Anecdotal examples can also add compelling color to an expert's analysis. In one case we are working on, we had to show that the plaintiff, a luxury and upmarket fashion brand, was competing for the same customers as the defendant, a downmarket fast fashion brand. We found numerous examples of users who are wearing both high-end and low-end brands at the same time. Thus, even though the brands were not priced or otherwise categorized similarly, the posts showed that they had overlapping customer bases, a situation which contributes to a likelihood of confusion. The next factor is marketing and advertising channels, which considers whether there is overlap in the way the plaintiff and defendant advertise and sell their products. Marketing and advertising has certainly changed since the Sleekcraft case was decided in 1979. In that case, the marketing and advertising data presented was related to boat shows, magazines, local newspapers, and as incredible as it seems to us today, classified telephone directories. Other traditional marketing channels an expert might examine today include TV and radio in addition to magazines and newspapers. And in addition to what we think of as traditional media, Today, a marketing expert would also look at new media, or new since 1979 anyway. Examples of new media include Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and other social networks, influencers and ambassadors, 
Google Ads, and Search Engine Optimization, often abbreviated as SEO, which generally refers to actions taken to improve rankings and search results. Viable has experience with all these types of online data and can provide thorough analyses to demonstrate overlap in marketing and advertising channels. The final factor I'm going to talk about is intent, which refers to the defendant's intent to confuse consumers. Typically, evidence of intent is found in internal business documents and emails, but a defendant's actions on social media and in other online environments can also be informative. For example, in 2018, Juul, the most popular brand of e-cigarettes and nicotine pods, sued Forex Pods, a company that sells aftermarket nicotine pods that are compatible with Juul's products. Juul alleged that Forex Pods was infringing its trademark by publishing posts that incorporated the Juul wordmark in the hashtags. At its core, this Juul case is all about social media data and is another example in which the courts have taken this kind of evidence seriously. The judge noted that lawsuits concerning use of hashtags as a mode of infringement are relatively new, but have been considered by the courts in previous cases. While the judge did rule in Juul's favor in its analysis of Forex Pod's intent, Juul could have strengthened its case by analyzing the extent to which Forex Pods was using the Juul wordmark in hashtags. It could have collected all posts published by Forex Pods, extracted all the hashtags used, and analyzed the results. Here's a mock-up of what that analysis could have looked like. In this case, the defendants used the Juul wordmark in nearly half of their Instagram posts, indicating there was a clear and intentional pattern of behavior by the defendant. Evidence from a defendant's website can also show intent. For example, it's possible to analyze whether a defendant intentionally inserted the plaintiff's trademark on its website in product description pages and meta description tags, or allowed search engines to index internal search pages. These efforts could show a defendant was actively seeking to improve its rankings in search results for a plaintiff's products. This kind of deliberate action could be used as evidence of intent. These are just a few examples of the way social media data can be used to support multiple factors in a likelihood of confusion analysis, which is generally a key issue in trademark infringement cases. Each case is different, and we can use our knowledge of social media to generate the right analysis to support any case involving consumer confusion. One additional note. In these types of infringement cases, evidence is often presented to establish and to link the asserted IP as being the reason for purchase and to document product switching and lost sales. This type of evidence, which can be mined from social media and entered into the record through a marketing expert, is often of interest to the damages expert because it links the infringement with consumer purchasing behavior. As well, as I mentioned at the beginning, there are many other IP issues where social media evidence can be informative. Other use cases include fame, dilution, secondary meaning, and genericness. Thanks for watching. Check out our deceptive advertising video to learn more about using social data in commercial litigation, and please contact us if you want to talk about our services generally or have a case you want to discuss. We're happy to have a quick look at the data and talk to you about what might be helpful for your case.